ಭೂತ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತ So blessings to everyone. Happy to see you here. And uh, we thought we would talk a little bit about the um, retreat and what happened uh, with this retreat that we just did and share a little bit of that with you. It was a very nice retreat. Uh, it was small and that's what was really nice. It was restful to do it. I didn't get worn out and I was able to complete it. So that was a very good thing. Uh, structurally, we had uh, uh, some things that we changed with the retreat. And um, I will talk to you first a little bit about some of the things that we uh, feel like it advanced the retreat in the teaching of TWIM, uh, because the Buddha was talking about mind-body connection. And because of that, uh, we always wonder, he had a lot of training in different forms of yoga and things in his time before he becomes a Buddha. And he not only did meditation of the mind, but also probably learned many other things in relationship, had a good, good connection with his body. And this is important. I have always had a, well, I would say for the last 10 years anyway, a strong suspicion that there was a, a distinct difference between the students who had no connection with their body and the students that had experienced a connection with their body through dance. And you may have heard me say this before, through dance, uh, modern dance or ballet or any type of movement with dance or with athletics or gymnastics um, in many forms of athletics, whether it's even just running and uh, the field events and things like that. But people who were having been exposed to these types of things where they made friends with their body and understood the operation of their body seemed to be making faster progress than those students who had no exposure to this. And so I always wanted to see what would happen with um, bringing in some type of practice that would give us a hint about the connection. And I was talking with uh, Lubo. I think these guys left though. We have one of them has a birthday today. So they're going to go out and, and do some things downtown and have a good time. This one that has the birthday is actually an international jujitsu a uh, practitioner and has done the international circuit and he doesn't do it anymore, but he left it. And he, uh, it's his birthday today. And he says he's feeling really old. He's 23. <laughs> They're like, woo, <laughs> having fun with that, you know? So I said, it's okay, now you're five. Three plus two is five, right? <laughs> so there you go and to have a good time playing today. And um, so what Hugh Poulton is here and Hugh is with us and he came with us on the retreat. And what I've heard so far from the students is it was spectacular. <laughs> it was just a wonderful experience because they got a very good experience uh, talking, you know, learning and listening to him explain sympathetic ner uh, nervous system and the, the energy that runs in your body and what happens in relationship to this. So you is here, I see he's here, and, um, but also Lubo's here. So I'm, you have five minutes, you can. Yes, okay, so I'm gonna actually ask 
uh, Lubomir to talk to you a little bit about what came out of working with you. And then I'm gonna have you talk to you because, because um, what happened, um, yeah, let me get this up, wait. What happened is in the morning, each morning we did a half hour uh, yoga session. Hello everyone. And this is Lubomir. Nice to meet you. Yes. And this is our class. And what he likes to talk to you about is a little bit about his experience with, with this and what he got out of it. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so uh, I do have some experience with yoga before I found Twim. Uh, I was working with many different yoga instructors and for the past few months, just before I met Sister Kema, which is about four months ago, I also learned yoga from Sadhguru. Uh, which I think is very good yoga, but with any type of exercise or yoga I've uh, ever encountered, there was always um, like a kind of a tension in my body. And it was, it was not effortless at all. So when I started doing Twim, I would uh, have to stop all my yoga practices because they were not really supporting my practice. Because when I meditate, uh, everything feels uh, almost effortless. And uh, I have to I relax my mind and I smile into it. But that's not what uh, most of the yoga instructors are teaching. Uh, but I always wanted to do some kind of exercise, right? So uh, I was very happy when a sister announced that you is going to come for the retreat because apparently he found a way how to combine twin with yoga practice. Uh, so when we started practicing with him, uh, we were lucky that we came one day early with me, Sister Kemma, and Aaron, which is uh, one of our other housemates. And uh, we had some um, private time with Hugh, which was just uh, priceless. And what he was teaching was uh, it's basically a buddhist yoga uh, where you can apply the practice and it's immediately effective you can immediately see the difference between what you have been doing before and what he showed us uh, so we were working with an energy center which would be here uh just underneath our belly and it was not anything crazy that we would have to concentrate with our minds but it was uh, about just bringing our intention there and uh, it brought balance and strength into my body without uh, consciously thinking about it without any strenuous effort uh, without having to apply any force. But at the same time, I was very strong. So great example of it is uh, like now I can talk about it, but it's complete, it's something completely different when I can experience it. So he would show us, I would maybe just stand, stand on my feet and you would tell me just uh, try to stand strong, you know? So I would just be strong and he would push me and I would just uh, fall over immediately because there was tension in my body, right? And then he would tell me stand strong, uh, not strong, but just stand, relax your body and stand from this energy center and relax your mind and smile into it. And then he would try to push me and even before he was going to push me, I could feel that I'm strong and that he's not gonna move me. And he just didn't. 
and there was no tension in my body whatsoever. I was not trying to be strong. I was not trying to be anything. And uh, I was like, wow, this is crazy. <laughs> uh, and then I would do the same thing, but he would tell me, think about something which uh, disturbs you. Think about something in your daily life which you don't like and it makes you angry or whatever. And then he would push me like just from the side and I would like immediately fall over. And then I would do the same thing when I think about something that makes me angry. But he would tell me, relax your mind and smile into it. And he would try to push me and my body would just not move. Uh, so the amazing thing about it was that uh, I could experience it. And it was about, it was just in five minutes, I could see the difference. And uh, it makes you believe that there is something about this practice and uh, what's so nice about it. Uh, we talked about with Sister Kema about it just before this uh, Zoom call, is that uh, if you apply six hours and swim or in your daily life, uh, the stuff you is teaching, not only that there is so many parallels with twin practice, I see it as a great extension of the practice. And I would say it's using six hours, but it's upgraded. Uh, it's essentially six hours 2.0, in my opinion. And because uh, I, would, I would be meditating and then I would be doing my daily activities uh with twin but sometimes there would still be tension in my body and uh, it might not be necessarily because uh, i'm stressed out but it would be because uh, i just uh, we just don't know as people how to do simple things and it could be just how to walk properly uh, if you would do some kind of exercise maybe running and stuff and uh, you, he just always like uh, uh, had like simple, uh, he just pinpointed the simple things we could focus on, like different parts of our body, which we could just uh, relax. So for example, with meditating, he would uh, tell us that if we sit, we should just uh, focus on, uh, not focus, but just if I would be sitting, he would tell us just roll your inner thighs inwards, uh, sit from your energy center. So there is no strength applied, but you are strong at the same time because this energy center supports you. And then he would just tell us uh, roll back your uh, inner shoulder blades, uh, smile into it, relax the tension in your head. Uh, so many parallels with twin. And just by applying this, uh, I was able to sit way longer than I've ever sit before. And a uh, lot less, it, it felt the sittings were a uh, lot less effort, I would say. So that was great. So, and yeah, so you had a really good extension on time that you could sit, but also because uh, he didn't have so much concern about body pains. Then in the overall retreat, um, I think he picked up a lot more information. Uh, he picked up a lot more of the fine points in the anatta training in the dependent origination. Your eyes got uh, open a lot uh, more than before as you were telling me during the retreat. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and so uh, this is affecting the overall situation of learning. Uh, these things and in Bonti's uh, training, the way that he was doing the training, uh, this is really important, the understanding, reaching, we're not interested in changing the order of the jhanas, for instance, or or, or deciding that some of them maybe didn't exist, or we're questioning the text that way. We're interested in attempting to experience what was left as the description and the outcome and seeing if we can experience that outcome. The way it was 
preserved in the texts. It's just two different things, okay? And um, and so you have to watch out for this, you see. And so um, instead of uh, having the vanishing of the, or one of the things some people seem to talk about sometimes is that there isn't really an infinite consciousness. Well, we can eliminate infinite consciousness because it's involved with so many texts. You'd have to change a great deal in the Majima Nikaya alone, in many, many suttas, not just one or two. If you decided to have that would disappear. And it was like, so we need to, we've always done this. You know, this is Bhante's path, was always to see if he could actually experience what was laid out and described um, for us to find, to discover, and, and experience the results the way they were described in the text. That's what's really fun to see if you can do that. That's what we've dedicated ourselves to for the past 25 years. Yeah. So I think these guys might be getting ready to leave, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. to take a, a day with Aaron. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're going to do some fun things down in the city. But uh, thank you for sharing. Yeah. That. And uh, just uh, one more thing I would like to add is that. Uh, Sister is always, she loves to explain this uh, stuff about past and future and how you only have one cup for each day, where if you focus too much on the past and too much on the future and you are not really living in the present time, you just come home in the evening and you are just tired. And uh, what this practice I learned from you, uh, is doing is that you are not uh, because you are not applying any force into your daily activities. It might be walking, it might be talking to someone, uh, it might be even exercise, going to the gym. There is always so much tension involved. And uh, if I would apply too much effort into these things, uh, and uh, there would be very high energy expenditure and I would just come home in the evening and just start. And what this practice was teaching me was how not to, that was not about energy expenditure, but it was more about conserving my energy. Mm -hmm. So I would just feel more relaxed during the day and I feel strong, but I don't have to, try so much all the time and yeah that's so, a really great feeling when that starts to mm -hmm. change the balance of things start to change and get more even and then it makes it so that you can move quickly if you need to mm -hmm. and you don't have to have a lot of aftermath of oh, exhaustion from doing that yeah because you're working with a balanced load in your life and so all of this is happening from the balancing of the, the mind and the body and a clear understanding. And he's gotten this through knowledge and vision, direct knowledge, direct experience. Okay. Yeah, really great. And uh, after him showing us a new way how to do things, uh, I don't think there is any coming back because uh, <laughs> we might do something like push-ups with like tension and effort, and then we would do it from the energy center. And uh, I told you that uh, it's a, he said, uh, he said this funny thing that uh, he would show this yoga to someone and they would say, it feels like cheating. <laughs> uh, which, uh, it kind of does because there is uh, basically, it does not feel effortless. And I was actually enjoying it. It feels enjoyable. So, uh, I'm not coming back to the old ways. Uh, I've been doing things and uh, I will definitely want to explore this more with you. And uh, yeah, I just think that the work he's doing is great. And I have never encountered anyone who is doing anything similar. So it's going to be quite exciting to see uh, what we can do about this. Yeah, well, they are. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Uh, uh, one more thing, I just wanted to say this. Hugh is in the airport, so he's uh, unable to kind of share because it's too noisy. 
So maybe okay. uh, he will come uh, next time or uh, maybe uh, he's, uh, uh, Wednesday uh, when we are there, maybe uh, he can share with us. Okay. okay. So we can go over some of the things that some of the areas that we talked about. Um, now we can go over some of the um, types of information that we looked into um, during, during the retreat. And um, I wanted to, to get, and you guys are going to go. So have a great day. Nice to meet you guys. Aaron. And have a great day. Have a good Bye. time. Happy birthday. Bye. I forgot to wish him. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Back over here into the light a little better. This is a little confusing, the light here. Let me try something. phase of looking at this um, using the experience that they were having with the hey hi I can see you so I'm ho hoping you were able to, <laughs> I was hoping you were able to hear some of that you know that that Lubo did and uh, talked about. Um, is there, can you, can we hear you? Your, your um, mic is off. Uh, you can hear me, but the, if the tannoy comes on, you'll probably hear nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, but we can hear you okay. Is there, um, did you hear what Lubo was talking about? Yes, uh, this, this, um, what's really nice about this approach to working with the body is that um, because you're releasing tension, this is very much uh, releasing part of the mind, which kind of owns the physical practice. So what you end up doing is kind of stepping out of the way and just letting the yoga do you rather than you do the yoga. Um, and so it, it doesn't build, uh, it, it doesn't build that tension or the energy, which is distracting in the practice. It actually yes. supports the practice by uh releasing this releasing this energy which is a uh, um uh, and just bringing the body as well as the mind back into balance and you become very sensitive to when tension just arises and so you can just move that into your practice and you get this clear link between the mind and the body which you can use to help you so sometimes the tension in the body occurs before you realize your mind has, has moved off the object or that you've got involved and so it's it's a it's an, just another way of working with twin. Uh, it just it's recruiting the language of the body into the practice, but it's not creating an attachment to the body. It's not creating a distraction to the body because what you want from the body is for it to be completely soft and relaxed. And when it's like that, it disappears. So, and I think it's probably yeah. the most most healthy state for the body is to be able to not just uh, exercising to lower our tension, but to be begin to live with our tension lowered yeah, is two absolutely. different things. You no, know? yeah, and this completely. is one of yes, one of the things we talk about in in the progress with meditation is that the slow types of progress we see um, is happening sometimes because of our attitude towards meditation has been drilled into us this is a retreat you know i go to do this i i had a friend once in malaysia who had a wonderful marriage too because he went for a one month retreat i used to make jokes with him a one month retreat four times a year <laughs> but this was his balance of life and he taught some of the materials from the text it was a wonderful teacher uh, but I used to tease him that, you know, we talked about this a lot because it can get more serious when it's shorter periods of retreats, even you're thinking that's where this belongs and not it's not internalized in life. And that's why we all like Bonte's book so much. Life is meditation. Meditation is life. That's what we're all trying to encompass. Permanent changes will you know, reasonably permanent um, neural pathways, new neural pathways that we can have in our minds that lead us to relaxation and balance in our practice and our yoga, both of them combined as two components for this. 
yeah. Yeah. So um, you're off to your flight. <laughs> Gosh. So we want you to come back. We want to keep going. <laughs> we were just talking about that this morning and saying some people want us to go to to uh, another one of the countries over here and visit and do some stuff. And so we'll see what happens next. It's really fun when you don't give up. Um, you know, I had a friend once who was ready to give up and at the time um, called her mother and said, you know, I'm really considering just exiting and not staying around anymore. Her mother got the drift. She was really considering ending her life, you know, rather than having to go on. And her mom only had one remark for her. If you leave, you won't see what happens next. <laughs> and that struck her so hard that she said, wow, <laughs> I can't leave. I won't find out what happens next. And it's too interesting to see. It's not always the most interesting thing, but it's, it's a, it's a story. You don't want to cut it short. You don't know what will happen next. So that's one of the things that should keep people curious and eager to find out what happens next. And then you come see us and we start to convince you, you have something to do with this. Fate may be fluid flowing along through the whole thing, but destiny is in the hands of you. Your destiny is in your hands. What will you make the decision you make at each tiny crossroad that you come to? Which way will you go? Okay, so what I wanna talk about a little bit and jump in if you have anything, you as we go along too, um, Lubo mentioned past and future and present time. And everybody kind of jumped on that and began to get it more and more during their retreat. The idea of staying in the present time through the whole retreat. But then I want you to leave and drive home in the present time. And I want you to live in the present time more than the time of the retreat. As long as you can live in the present time, you have, <clears throat> you have removed the backpack of the past. You have put it down or hung it up on a hook and you have taken off the front pack and hung it up on a hook. And now what you have to deal with is the mind without pressure from either side pushing at you. This is what is so important. Yeah. Dr. Weira, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah. How are you, Sissy? I'm doing fairly well. I'm doing yeah. okay. Good. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I it's up. Your face. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell my friend she's worried about me. She's. I said, don't worry. As long as I can teach the Dhamma, I get this energy. And yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why it's keeping going, you see. So um, it's it's painful sometimes, but we just play with that and try to figure out where to go with it. And many times we can just desert ship and sit in meditation, but we want to keep going in other ways too. So we just yeah, find yeah, out yeah. step at a time how we're going to do it. But I'm doing okay in considering yeah. it everything yeah yeah so I'm, how are you i'm glad how to see you? you like this today <laughs> because i have every morning as i told you i, I vibrate the brahma Vihara energy to bhante vimal ramsi to you mm -hmm. and uh, from my far side i see that you getting better you know? <laughs> and now i can see, see yeah it's really <laughs> I would like, I hope that Bonte gets it as well. He needs it, yeah. you know, and he, yeah, he's a tough old one. He is, <laughs> you know, but he's, uh, the venerable is still in there. It's just difficult to find the venerable sometimes, but it's, that's the nature of the dementia. Yeah. 
so but he's there you know you can feel it when you uh connect with him and visit him that's what they tell me so that's what i like to hear in that case Mm -hmm. so do you have any questions about what we were talking about uh sorry i was late yeah it was late as well (laughs) okay okay. yeah nearly the end of the it's all right. It's all right. Mm-hmm. You've got time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Time is uh, fluid. Only I like to, to ask this then because I, I got my student. He asked me why we, we must uh, practice the, what's it called? The Sahabat Ram- friend. Yeah. Why do we why practice? We have to train, practice uh, with the spiritual friend. Okay. Yeah. What the Buddha must, was uh, the Buddha. take a friend and then uh, vibrate and uh, give him the okay. direction. And why? Actually, uh, he wants to know why. Well, yeah. Buddha was teaching us how to develop the power of the Brahma Viharas. Mm-hmm. And this is actually a very powerful thing. First of all, we send it to ourselves, but why would we send it to ourselves? Usually people are saying, why do you send it to yourself? Isn't that selfish? Well, if if I don't have, if I don't have this in my hand like this, if I don't have it in my hand, I cannot give this to you. The secret jewel of the answers of everything. <laughs> okay, so here, if I send some to myself, then I can share some with you. Now the Buddha, for instance, there is a misunderstanding with merit sometimes. Let's take this as an example. You practice things because you want to build merit sometimes in Buddhism. But we must be very careful that we don't change the phrases that have to do with merit and say we have to give our merit away. When we are doing our prayer, we are sharing merit with people, but we're not giving, we're not Mm -hmm. emptying our cup completely. We would be in a bad way if if we came to the point of death and we had an empty cup. Oops. (laughs) You know, oops. What happens then? If we'd have no merit left, we gave it all away. (laughs) So actually, we are supposed all of those prayers we should be very protective of them, that they don't get changed in modern times to giving it all away because it was about sharing merit and being sure that when you have some of this, you share it with someone else. Now, there's a number of reasons why we work with the, with the different supports that make our practice work. And the earliest one, was Dana Sila Bhavana. Mm -hmm. The earliest one was not Sila Samadhi Panya. This is what's interesting. And if if you look around you now in some of the larger temple structures and the Sunday school materials, you're going to find it might not be there very much at all, the the, uh, Dana Sila Bhavana. But Dana was very, very important. The dana is generosity and the purpose of the generous acts that you do is to open up your heart, to wake up the heart. And the older we get, the tighter our heart gets closed. The correct position for the successful meditator is with an open heart. And it's all about how much the person is giving to how much in the end the person receives. That's a funny one. There's the Christian. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. yeah. So it's a it's an alignment. Yeah. You you're you're on uh, your mic. Some. I'm sorry, it's very noisy. That's okay. 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 Um, and and when you when you get used to taking tension out of your body as well as your mind in daily life, what you're not doing is you're not pushing that tension onto other people. Right. And this is an, also an act of generosity, not only to yourself, but to others. Right. That's exactly right. So it's another balancing point. So when we talk dana, sila bhavana, 
we have to be protective that for the children, especially, we don't just tell them this means give money to the temple, give support to the monks, and that's all we say. We have to be very careful of this, you know, because as much as maybe we'd like them to learn that above all, this is the highest one you can do. If you wish to continue with that, that's okay. But what are you doing it? What's happening when you're doing it? What are you doing it for? You are doing it to open your heart. And as you open your heart to give to the others, then it what goes around comes around. What you put out, you get back. There's a tremendous amount of karma being taught in the world outside of Buddhism, yeah, you know, you see. So when you, when you first, you're, pr you're practicing to give it to yourself so you have it, it's like filling up your gas tank. And then you're going to send it out to others and it's going to go further than that. And this is how you change the world. Well, how do you change the world? Well, the Buddha will tell you that when you're practicing the metta, there are no thoughts of hatred and ill will can come up in your mind. And you can't, you can't do both things, only do one at a time. So if you are then adding in compassion, when you are doing the uh, compassion, the moment you start practicing your karuna, well, then no thoughts of cruelty can be coming up. So this cruelty, torture, beating, fighting, brawling, all of this just disappears. The, the, the heat of that vibration, that frequency just breaks. Those, those negative frequencies are extremely low. And the frequency for meta, for instance, is 500 and something. And the frequency for hatred and ill will is something silly like 20 or 30 like that you see it's way low and the same thing happens with cruelty and the same thing happens with discontent and the same thing happens with aversion to everything now my point is don't believe me <laughs> okay my point is go out and try it for a week and see what happens when you live on the other side of the fence. And this one is illustrated really well in the Dwaita Vitaka Sutta, when we teach you number 19 in the beginning, is it 19 or 21? Um, the Dwaita Vitaka, mm -hmm. yeah, the Dwaita Vitaka is 19. And just the opening part of the Sutta tells us what is the Buddha up to here? And let's remember, he wasn't a Buddha when he was talking about this. He was saying, monks, before my enlightenment, when I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, then it occurred to me, uh, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes. And so I set up my thoughts of sensual desire, uh, thoughts of ill will and thoughts of cruelty, you see. And I set up on the other side, the thoughts of giving up uh, renunciation or you know, the generosity, giving up the personal stuff, non-ill will, which is loving kindness and thoughts of non-cruelty, which is compassion, you see? So he sets up a science experiment basically on this side or this side. And then he decides to live over here for a couple of weeks and mm -hmm. live over here for a couple of weeks. And look at the consequences of this. See, this is what I like about teaching what the Buddha is teaching. I'm not dictating it to you. I'm not just telling you this is it. Now go away and do it. I'm saying to you, don't believe me. Go and test all of this. This is a man who went through 100,000 lifetimes. Take it or leave it if you believe it or not, but I do. Okay. And, and, just even if he went through a tiny part of that many lifetimes and he, he checks this stuff out, then he's rediscovering it in this lifetime that he's going through as a bodhisattva. And he's telling you, test it, test it, test it. You see? Another place we have this idea of testing everything. 
is when we teach you about anatta. We start to teach you about the anatta, but we um, he does it in the form of drills. You are listening to him recite the drills that he wants his monks to go out and practice after this evening's Dhamma talk. So when we go all the way to 148, and we listen to how did he set this up, okay? Um, what he did was he says to them, he's going to prove to them, this is how he, this is how he explains anatta. He comes to them and he says, um, First of all, let's talk about not self. And he says, here's the drill, how I investigated this, okay? If anyone tells you the I is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the I is seen and understood. And since it's rise and fall are discerned, understood, okay? It would follow my self rises and falls. So that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say the I is self and thus the I is not self. Now he's going to take you through the I and the forms and the I consciousness, right? And the I contact and the I feeling and the I craving. So there's six parts to this, six parts. And he, so there's a lot of repetition in this when you when you listen to this or recite it. And then he's going to do it with the ear and with the nose and with the tongue and with the body. And that's your external experience. And he wants, he's saying for you, go ahead, go out there and, and review this in your mind. Walk around with it and just for a moment, try to prove that the I is your personal I and that you can order your eye what to see. That's really funny. You can't order your eye what to see or your ear what to hear or your nose what to smell. You can't do that. It just operates, you see. So he's challenging you to test it, but he doesn't stop there. You know, he goes on and he goes into once, th this part that I just mentioned was demonstration of not self. Here's the problem, he says. Then he says, the origin of this identity, he's going to show you how come the monks are sitting there thinking probably, okay, how come we got into this situation where we all believe that, that everything is personal and everything that happens in life is me, it is mine, it is myself. How did we get there? And he's basically describing here how little children learn. Little children learn by watching other people around them. And he says, now listen to me. This is the way that was leading to the origin of this identity. One regards the I thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And then regards um, the uh, forms and then the consciousness, the contact, the feeling again. So he's taking you through that whole thing, right? And he's showing you how um, you got into this problem of believing this. And it's no trickery here. Everybody's walking around thinking this way. But then he says, uh, they wonder, well, if that's true, how could we how could we have the cessation of this idea of identity? How could we change this? And now he goes through it again. And he explains that the way leading to the cessation of identity is this. You regard the I, this is not mine. This I am not, this is not myself. Now these are drills. He's expecting them. And I know this because this is the way I was trained by Bonte, who was a forest monk, and then they trained him as forest monks, where every time they tell you anything, they expect you to go out and test it. And so we had to just go out the next day and work in the forest. And as we're working, we start reciting. But this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. How do I feel after that? 
I feel much lighter. I don't have so much responsibility yeah. anymore. You see, I just lifted all this responsibility off of myself, you see. Now, all of this, he's teaching us how to see the reality, the actuality. Well, Dr. Um, Karuna Dasa was an author who wrote a book from University of Hong Kong. And in his book, he points out that this is how they were coming to understand this by testing it constantly. And I was happy to see him writing about this because I believed this strongly, but he had the authority with all his degrees to write this book. It was great. You know, the way he did that book is special. Just imagine 10 chapters in a PhD thesis and each chapter is 10 pages long and that's it. That's the most amazing thesis I ever laid my eyes on, you know, and my gosh, he was so precise. I got to go and talk to him while I was in uh, Sri Lanka and, um, and, and interview him about some of the things he wrote in there. He was really a genius. Anyway, um, then you have the abandonment. He said, if they said, okay, if we're stuck with this, this viewpoint that we have, and that's the alternative. Well, you know, how do we abandon this? And he shows them how to practice letting go. And then as they practice letting go of it, he, he's expecting them to go out. They usually had these Dhamma talks in the evenings and sometimes long, like two, three, four hours long. <laughs> but they had these Dhamma talks with the Buddha. And then the next day, during the time they were sitting after their chores and going for their bowl and do cleaning up the refectory and cleaning up their cootie and sitting in the morning time, then they would have their meal, then they would come and rest for half an hour, and then they would go and have and sit somewhere else for the day. And when they're doing that constantly, they're reviewing this stuff rolling it around constantly in your mind and applying it. They're not just reading a book and saying, oh, I read that book. <laughs> no books, there were no books. So this constant repetition has happening. And then they come to the abandonment of the tendencies. And what happens if you abandon them? Then it becomes possible for you uh, if you think that you are going to be able to experience the opening of the mind, or what I call the rebooting or restarting of the mind, okay, that it is possible that that can happen for you if the conditions become right. So what are the conditions? Well, the conditions are that if you uh, a pleasant feeling comes up, you do not delight in it, welcome it, and remain holding to it. And the underlying tendency then of lust does not lie within you. So you're practicing constantly. Now, where does this come with the science all over again? We've talked about that here. The science of this comes to the neuroplasticity that's being uh, studied now and how we learn a habit and why we feel stuck with the habit and how can we let go of the habit? And what is it that feeds the hindrances. And this is what we did in this retreat. We got to the place where we started to talk about the different ways of handling a hindrance without getting involved with it in any way at all. Because the key message, even if it doesn't say the word abandonment in the text itself, the key, when you boil it all down like this and you deductive reasoning, the bottom the very bottom last one is abandonment. Abandon the hindrance. Stop feeding the hindrance. And I came to the conclusion, well, if we want world peace, what we should be doing is having a four-day retreat for these people when they come. <laughs> and we should be teaching these representatives of all these different countries we should be showing them, first of all, for the first day you teach them dependent origination, and then you show them how war happens. 
Isn't that interesting? Have you ever heard of a peace conference where they come to sit down and talk about how war works? And, but on the flip side of the coin, isn't it ridiculous to you that they never did that? Because how can we ever abandon something until we know how it works? Or how can we change something if we don't know how it works to begin with? We can't. And we aren't. And we won't until we get this in our minds clearly. Somebody has to suggest the meeting is not about things you want to try and you dream about trying and blah, 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 blah. It has to first be, how do we have war in the first place? How does it happen? And so the Buddha knew this and what he comes to the conclusion in the uh, teaching on anatta, he comes to the end point where the underlying tendencies, when they are abandoned, then it is possible for the person uh, to, to experience the opening of the mind. And what is this opening of the mind? It is with complete understanding, complete knowledge and complete direct knowledge. And you've gotten there through knowledge and vision your personal knowledge and vision over and over again of how everything actually works. And then when the mind opens, it, it turns off and it, it does say in the text, uh, it reads, I've been researching this, I'm not finished yet, but um, it does say that feeling and perception turn off, but there's a problem with that. Because when feeling and perception turn off, so does consciousness. And we have suttas that bear witness to this. Plus, if I've had some experiences with accidents where I'm falling into consciousness and then coming out and perceiving and feeling, you see? So the one I'm talking about is in 43, where it's basically telling you in the Mahavidala Sutta, uh, when you go there, it's basically telling you perception, feeling, and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. It is impossible to separate these three states from the others, each one from the others, in order to describe the difference between them. For what one feels, that one perceives, and what one perceives, that one cognizes. And that is why these states are conjoined. They are not disjoined. It is impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. This is very significant because when the tree fell on me, you've all heard me tell this story. When the tree fell on me and I was falling into unconsciousness and then coming out, and then falling in and coming out, I couldn't perceive and feel without consciousness. You see, so you, you can walk around. I didn't believe this at first. I argued with Monty. He just laughed and said, take a walk in the woods and try to be conscious without feeling and perception or try to perceive something without feeling and consciousness. <laughs> or try to be conscious without perceiving or feel you, you can't do it and then I had to go back and we say eat crow <laughs> is an expression where I was okay silly I'm just being silly uh, you were right of course yeah but you had to figure it out of course he said and I I went and uh, we were at peace about that <laughs> yeah but but this is how we are supposed to be learning in Buddhism, testing all of this. And when we stop testing it, we find ourselves in some pretty bad predicaments in the world, you see? So it all comes back with me constantly to the war and peace that my grandchildren might have to deal with. So coming back to why would I teach 
a person to practice with one person because then I'm trying to open what is really going on in the Brahma Viharas. I am trying to teach you to reopen a communication system that is, exists in all human beings and gets closed down somewhere between childhood and adulthood. And if we can reopen this, it doesn't mean that you will become childish. <laughs> it means that you can reason in a more childlike way. And if we understand childlike, what that means is a significant thing that childlikeness is simplicity, not complexity. And we are caught in a complex world that forbids us to look at the simplicity that existed with peace and harmony. That's where we're stuck. So you start by working by sending it to one person, but the devilment of practicing, and this is truly the devilment, this is Mara in action, Okay, in teaching you the Brahma Viharas, what's difficult is I want you to wish for the other person to have the same feeling of contentment and uh, happiness and, um, you know, relaxed mind, tranquility, all the equanimity. I want you to wish for the person to have it. I don't want any effort to be put out to deliver it, send it, radiate it, emanate it. it. You know, we tried to say shine. If you just sit there and shine, that's about the best one. And the kids, I asked the children in the younger groups at one point, what they thought, and they said, we have to just shine. And then the shine, the light will shine. Illuminate was a word, glowing, we can glow. You know, and if you start smiling, you're, you'll start smiling more. This is how you change your habitual uh, tendency to be stuck. Nobody is stuck. This is the most, uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, what should be getting the biggest reward in the world? What is it? I can't remember. The big, you know, prize uh, award they give every year. Uh, that should go to the person that... Um, Nobel Peace Prize? Yeah, the Nobel Peace Prize should be going to the person that just starts to smile and it becomes an epidemic of smiling. Because when you smile, what are you doing? The doctors want you to smile. It relieves the pressure on your heart, your circulation, your gastrointestinal system, your lungs, everything. You say, so what they want you to smile. We, this smile is not just loosening your, your brain where the beginning of the orders come down for everything. It does that, but because it does that, remember what I told you about the brain. <gasps> Oh my, it's a busy bee. <laughs> you know, he's got so much to do, the brain, the heart, it just pumps. I mean, the heart's miraculous, but it just pumps. That's it, it pumps. And the lungs, they breathe. That's it, folks, okay? And the kidneys clean the blood and you got the liver, but the brain, oh my gosh. He's got to coordinate the sending of whatever it is they need for all of them to be working. It starts here. So when we set this free of sending the loving kindness to ourselves and starting to smile, we're sending relief to the whole system of the body. And this is where he finds this mind-body connection. Of course, it uh, seems simplistic when I say it this way, but it is simplistic. That's the thing. And when you watch... Um, certain people, I don't know where I, what I did with my phone. If you saw my grandchild, the one that, uh, uh, the most uh, recent one, she's now, my goodness, I think pushing two and a half, okay? And um, 
to see her, she pops out and she was like, oh, I'm here. Okay. The world is here. I'm here. I just got here. And this is the way she looks. She was amazing. She had this face I've never seen on a baby before that young. She's just so excited to be here and so happy to be with you. And um, I have yet to hold her in my arms. I hope I get to do it um, because she's special, you know, just so special. And my others are too. I don't get to see them as uh, really I committed monastic. We don't fraternize a lot with our families and I didn't, you know, but um, this one's got my heart and my grandson is eight years old now competing in these little road race things with, you know, all the stuff with the bikes and stuff, pedal bikes, you know, there they've got the world uh, by the tail. I hope and pray they get their spiritual balance in there too with everything. I can't say what will happen, but that is what the world needs to understand the mental and physical and spiritual body is what makes us whole and balanced. Now, the other day I said something at a, at the, I said it at the retreat, I could tell they didn't know about this. But when you have a breakdown and you go into a hospital situation, the doctors usually don't want to let you go out and live in mainstream, try to live in the mainstream again until you can prove to them, show them that you're in, you have a clear understanding of what has happened to you mentally, whatever it is, whether it's depression or an accident or whatever has happened, and that you have an understanding the physical side of what happened, but you have a, um, a clear understanding of the mental side of it. So this is mental and physical, but then they have a third requirement. They, they want you to show them also that you have a, 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 you know, a support tree of people that you can talk with when you go out and try and live again in the community. And I worked for four years with mental health, human rights. And this is a very touchy subject because they want to live independently and everybody's afraid they won't be able to and get hyper protective of them. And so they have a hard time trying to get back into society, get balanced. But the thing is spiritual path, you have to prove to the doctor, you have a planned spiritual investigation or path that you are also looking into. It can be anything, anything at all from uh, any of the Christian faiths or Buddhist or Muslim or any faith at all. It can even be Wicca, which is the different types of um, white witchcraft, not bad stuff, but very sweet, loving stuff connected with nature and this sort of thing. They don't care. They just want to know that that part of you is back turned on again, as well as your mental and physical balance. And I think this is fascinating because they uh, tend to the medical community, the allopathic medical community doesn't always want the um, Ayurvedic community to talk to them. <laughs> they don't always want to talk about the, the ways of using herbs and using uh, the earth to heal the person. They want to go in the direction of modern medicine completely and shut the door. And that's kind of unfair, but anyway, um, all of it's about balance. And the Buddha was teaching a balance to everyone. So when he teaches you this part about the Brahma Viharas, he's teaching for you individually to open your heart, then to contribute by giving to another person, sharing with them what you know about this practice to help them to uplift themselves and open their heart, to live the dana, live the generosity. And then we ask you to, uh, to challenge the barriers. With the barriers, what it means, 
to practice overcoming the barriers in the Brahma Viharas, we start with one uh, person, one, uh, you know, one target, which is a spiritual friend. And then we ask you to take three more. Now, when you're working on the barriers, three more people that are the same kinds of people, same sex, living, not deceased and not ill or injured, because you don't want to think about all of that. You just want to send them the loving kindness. And then you take four family members and then you take four neutral people who can be the postman or the, someone you see the gardener or somebody who you see, but they're not close friends, you use them. And then you take four troublesome people is what we like to call them, people who are difficult to work with. And you have to send them loving kindness. If you have trouble sending loving kindness to them, you can go back to a neutral person and get it a little stronger and then come back and you might have to do that several times if it's somebody difficult for you that lives next door or something. And then after you finish working with those, what have you done is the question. Those, that exercise is a quiz and shouldn't take you more than one sitting to do it. It's not a big extended thing. And you do it one person at a time. So that was, um, I think, um, let's see, there's four fours are 16. So it's 15 additional people that you're gonna run through, but you're only asking them to come through the door and you smile at them and see if they smile back. That's all you're doing. And when you smile at them, do they smile at you? And you say, yes, thank you, you can go home. Next person, next person, next person. And when you do that practice, then you're finished sending to each person, okay? And when you finish that, you tell us. And you're, it means that your brain is connecting, reconnecting the communication system. We've been trying to connect. It's like they turned on the uh, inside between the brain and the heart, you know, connect, reconnected this, uh, uh, communication system. That's what it means. So it was a quiz for your brain. That's all it was. You didn't have to do anything except may you be happy. May your mind be peaceful. May you be calm and they smile and you smile and that's it. After that, you learn how to work with the directions. That's the next step in the process and learning to work with direction should give you some kind of a hint here because first we aimed this at one person and then we aimed it at 15 more individual people. And now we're going to send it to all beings in a particular direction. So now you're gonna send it like this, but it's going to go like that when it goes out in the direction. How can you use this in life, Sister Kama? I had a man and another man in a knife fight once in a parking lot and I was across the street and they were going to start fighting. And all I had to do was stop for a moment and just bow my head and just aim in that direction and send as hard as I could. And then all of a sudden everything stopped and they were standing there with their knives in their hand, looking around, trying to figure out what just happened. They didn't know. But see, when I was trained originally, we used to get on a bus in Washington, DC on a Monday morning and sit in the back of the bus. And then people that get on on Monday morning are always grouchy and grumpy because they have to go back to work. <laughs> and we, when they started getting mean with each other, we were supposed to just sit there with our heads down and just simply send this into the bus. Just means shine it into the bus. And then they would stop. Now you tell me, how did that work? How does it work? I don't care. That's what I would say. I don't know how to explain it to you, except that 
MIT and Harvard, they looked at some of this and they said, well, it's a frequency. It's a, um, it's a, it's a pulsating frequency that is flowing off of you. And you emanate this frequency like a TV frequency or a radio frequency. And so it, it has substance and it goes out from you and spreads around you like your aura spreads, but your aura is only here, you know, following your body, okay? And can come out as far as from what I've read you know, and seen pictures of and stuff, you know, only out about four inches, five inches from the body. But this is what we see in the, uh, in the classical paintings, when we see uh, the angels or Christ or anything, any deities, we see this, something's going on around the head emanating out. And this is what we're talking about. This is what's really flowing from you. If you don't think that you affect people, I challenge you to go to a, uh, a mall and go and where the people are walking towards you you sit and you just keep smiling with your eyes closed and you see what happens. And you do, you can do it the other way first. You sit there and just frown. Just hang your head down and just, you know, frown. And then nothing happens, but if you open your eyes, nobody's there, nothing particular happening. But if you sit up and just start smiling mm. and shine. Open your eyes and see who's standing around you. And a lot of times it's children are standing close to you. If you do it by a fountain, they wanna see the fountain, but they're coming close to where you are. And these kids are there and they sense this, they're open to it. And the busier we get and the older we get, the less open to it we are unless we know it exists and we can turn off the world and open ourselves to this, these energies. So these energies are very, very real. And it's sometimes I think it's unfortunate that we live in this time because we've, we've moved so far away from them in our computerized, mechanized noise and so much going on, so many vibrations that are unnecessary and not part of us it's vibrating around us that we can't seem to sense what we're talking about when we talk this way. But it's real. And the only way to get a person to uh, accept it is not to try to get them to accept it at all. Just give them a chance to go out and experience it. But you see the, the reason Dr. Weir, that the, that the person is, is practicing to send to the one person is it's the first step in opening the communication system, you see? And then if they get a, a response, a smile back from that person or a feeling that that person is smiling too, that comes toward them, feel, they feel it. Then when they start working with the other people, they're kind of amazed at how fast this will happen, that the person smiles back. And it's a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process. And you're not doing anything but watching. This is what's fun about it. So even in my weakest moments, my final moments, I can lay there and just shine, you see? You can, because it don't have to do anything, just be. One time I had a student, no matter what I did, um, we were having difficulty, but Bonte and I, in working with him, he tried to, and then I, um, I don't remember which one of us said it first, but um, we put him on forgiveness, and no matter which one of the phrases we tried to use with forgiveness, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Like I forgive myself for making mistakes or I forgive myself for not understanding. We really thought that one would work to open him up 
and get in touch and release this pressure that was inside of him. And what it was in the end that got him to open up was I forgive myself for never allowing myself to just be. That was it. And it was like a crack and all the caught up emotion, everything broke through and emptied out. And he saw, the started to see what had happened from the time he was young all the way to where he was at that time. And this had been um, a situation of being raised in an environment where there was absolute control over the child and no way for the child to breathe or imagine breathing on their own. So all creativity to a large extent, the, what happened in the end, he was a conductor uh, you know, of, of music and his music completely changed. Now, this is not surprising to me because I had a student before whose art the art, the painting completely changed. And a man from um, Colombia, um, Bogota, Colombia. And his case, he was a very fine artist, but with colors that were very not uplifting colors. In his case, when he went through this practice, it changed him to completely open up to a new set of colors. And the, the paintings just burst forth off of the canvases. And this happened because of opening up to the inside of his heart and his whole, uh, whole being, you know, just being free that way. So I hope this answers your question. We went for a long trip there, <laughs> but we, we talk a lot about how it connects and how it's about the communication system and how you go one step at a time in order to develop it. The Buddha was a genius at doing that. Even when he talked to you about your hindrances, he knew you could you would be in a situation in three different levels in the hindrances. One first beginner would not know the hindrance was a problem until they were all the way over to the hindrance. Then they would six R. And then if they keep practicing, the second student would know that you only have to go this far away, get pulled this far away, like you're moving towards the hindrance and they would let go of it here and come back, relax and smile and come back. And finally, the advanced student notices the change in the tension and tightness in the body as the hindrance, the dislike for something or the dislike of the disturbance or the distraction, as soon as they feel the the tension in their body or their mind, they let go and relax and keep going. And that person is the one that goes the deepest and the longest. So you see that the Buddha had so many things interconnected. If someone said, what do you fear most for Buddhism? I would say change. If people start changing it, changing the order it was written in or changing uh, the meaning, only tiny fractions you have to change and it's gone. It's gone. The results that he talked about are gone. Only tiny little changes. One man, he decided, you know, we all want to make things unique. And when we start teaching something, this is the only thing I can remember where I don't want to make it unique. Uh, the only unique thing about me is my life and the stories, I guess. But, but. Um, I don't want to change it and say, this is mine. I only want to reflect what he was trying to show you and stick with reading it to you as much as possible when I present it to you, okay? But there was a situation where the, um, 
someone wanted to make it theirs personally when they started to teach it. And when they did that, they wrote a small book and the book took a Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta. This is a funny example, but a Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta, I believe needs to stay a Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta, <laughs> okay? And they decided they're gonna be unique and when they write it, they're gonna do it alphabetically. And so they wrote it Anatta, Anicca, Dukkha. Now, if you sit and think about this for a while, you'll begin to understand the difficulty with this. Because when you change that like that, you are not going to learn so many lessons. Why? Because Anicca um, is the impermanence. And there's so many lessons about when things change, dukkha arises. And when the suffering arises, it's happening that the only way out of the suffering is through anatta. So if you start changing this stuff around, how are you going to change all those stories and Jataka tales and endless things that have been written across the centuries to match with what you're doing? So <laughs> let's don't change it. Instead of changing it, figure out what it really meant. If you left it in the order, it was changed from the Pali or from the Chinese and the Agama, same situation, okay? Figure it out for yourself, but don't change the, the translation, for instance, to fit with your personal experience. Do you see the problem? That's a big problem, you know, unless there's no unless, you know, he had, he had, he had um, it pretty clearly written out on that's a real interesting one, isn't it? <laughs> you know? So it's dig, dig, dig. Now, if you want a quick um, lesson in I do this instead for you. I'll talk about the retreat next week. How's that? Because we had a lot to do with that, but it's a long, been a long talk. But I will give you a very small, small sutta that is fun, but you have to write it down. All right. So you get a pen and paper, and and we will um, we will look at this sutta that's near the front. Wait a minute, we can go in the back. Wait a minute. Mm. 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 Wait a minute. Well, I'm not having a good time here. Let me see what's happening. Um, okay, I'm trying to find Vamika. Can anybody tell me what the number is? Bhante, can you tell me what the number is on the Vamika Sutta? I'll check. I have to check also. Mm. I don't know why I can't remember the number. It's a low number, but I'm trying to... Is it 23? That's it. Okay, it's page 237 for anybody that's trying to find it. Page 237. Yeah, you do this next Wednesday? No, I'm going to do it for you right now, but you have to write it down because I'm not going to, I'm not going to explain it. I want you to see the magical way that the Buddha uh, teaches his suttas sometimes. He teaches it with a lot of little pieces and then you have to find out what it means, okay? So each time I tell you one of the pieces, I'll tell you. It's called the Vamika Sutta and it's the ant hill. Thus I have heard on one occasion, the blessed one was living in Sawati in Jetas Grove. And not the Pindicus Park. And on that occasion, the venerable Kumara Kasapa, he was living in the blind men's grove. 
And when the night was well advanced, a certain deity of beautiful appearance who illuminated the whole of the blind man's grove approached the venerable Kumara Kasapa and stood at one side. So standing, the deity said to him, Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu, this anthill fumes by night and flames by day. So that's the first one. Okay, it fumes by night and it flames by day. Thus spoke the Brahmin. Delve with the knife. So here's the first one. Delve with the knife. Oh, wise one. Delving with the knife. The wise man, the wise man, he saw a bar. So over to the right, you put a bar. That's the first thing he found. A bar, O oh venerable sir. And thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the bar. Delve with the knife, O oh wise man. And delving with the knife, the wise one saw a toad. This is, the next one is the toad. A toad, O oh venerable sir. Hmm. Thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the toad. Now delve with the knife means dig with the knife. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, I looked away. Yeah, throw the door. Dwell. Delving, delving with the knife. The wise man, the wise one saw a fork. So now we have a fork. So now you have a bar, you have a toad, and you have a fork. A fork, oh venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the fork, delve with the knife again. Delving with the knife, the wise man saw a sieve. S-I-E-V-E, -E, sieve. A sieve, oh venerable sir. That's what you shake things through to make them smaller. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the sieve. Delve with the knife, thou wise man, delving with the knife. The wise man saw a tortoise. So now you have a, a tortoise, right? A tortoise. Oh, venerable sir, it's a turtle. Thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the tortoise, delve with the knife, oh, wise man. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a butcher's knife and block. A butcher's knife and block. Oh, venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the butcher's knife and block. And delve with the knife, the wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a piece of meat. A piece of meat. O oh, venerable sir, thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the piece of meat. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. And delving with the knife, the wise man saw a Naga serpent. A Naga serpent, O oh venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, leave the Naga serpent. Do not harm the Naga serpent. Honor the Naga serpent. You can circle that one. You should go to the blessed one, Bhikkhu, and ask him about this riddle. Bhikkhu, other than the Tathagata, or a disciple of Tathagata, or one who has learned it from them, there is no one in this world with its gods, its maras and brahmas in this generation with its recluses or its brahmins, its princes and its people, whose explanation of this riddle will satisfy the mind. That is what was said by the deity who thereupon he vanished at once. Then when the night was over, the venerable Kumara Kasapa, he went to the blessed one and after paying homage to him, he sat down on one side and told the blessed one what had happened. And then he asked venerable sir, what is the anthill? What is the fuming by night? What the flaming, what is the flaming by day? Who 
is the Brahman? Who is the wise one? What is the knife? What the delving? What the bar? What the toad? What the fork? What is the sieve and the tortoise? What is the butcher's knife and block? And what is a piece of meat? And what is the Naga serpent? Bhikkhu, listen carefully. The anthill is a symbol for this body made of material form, consisting of four great elements procreated by the mother and father, built up out of the boiled rice and porridge, subject to impermanence to be worn and rubbed away to dissolution and disintegration. So it's your body from head all the way to your toes and how you came about. That's what that one is. What one thinks and ponders by night based upon one's actions during the day, that is the fuming by night. So what goes on in your daytime that's what you fume about at night. That's what keeps you awake. So if you live by your eight precepts and you have calmed your day, you will calm your night. The actions one undertakes during the day by body, speech, and mind after thinking and pondering by the night, that is the flaming of each day. The Brahman is a symbol for the Tathagata accomplished and fully enlightened. The wise one is a symbol for a, a bhikkhu in higher training. The knife is a symbol for noble wisdom. The delving is a symbol for the arousing of your energy. The bar, it is a symbol for ignorance, throw out the bar, abandon your ignorance, delve with the knife, wise one, this is the meaning. The toad is a symbol for anger and ir irritation. Throw out the toad, abandon anger and irritation, delve with the knife, thou wise one, it's the meaning. The fork is a symbol for doubt. Throw out the fork, abandon your doubt. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The sieve is a symbol for the five hindrances, namely the hindrance of sensual desire, the hindrance of ill will, the hindrance of sloth and torpor, slow, dull mind, and the hindrance of restlessness, guilt, and remorse, and the hindrance of doubt. Throw out the sieve, abandon the five hindrances. There, we, there goes the abandon again, right? Delve with the knife, thou wise one, this is the meaning. The tortoise, it's a symbol for the five aggregates affected by clinging. Now remember, there's nothing wrong with the five aggregates. They're not causing suffering. Only I am if I crave and I cling to them. Always the aggregates alone are innocent. They are only causing suffering when I am craving, I am clinging. Material form aggregate affected by clinging. The feeling aggregate affected by clinging, perception aggregate affected by clinging, formations aggregate affected by clinging, consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. Throw out the tortoise, abandon the five aggregates affected by clinging and delve with the knife because this is the meaning. The butcher's knife and block, the symbol for the five cords of sensual pleasure forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, 
connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Sounds, odors, flavors, tangibles that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provoking lust. Throw out the butcher's knife and block. Abandon the five cords of sensual pleasure. Delve with the knife, O oh wise one. This is the meaning. Now the piece of meat is a symbol for delight and lust. Throw out the piece of meat. Abandon delight and lust. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The Naga serpent. That is the symbol for a bhikkhu who has destroyed the taints. Leave the Naga serpent. Do not harm that Naga serpent. Honor the Naga serpent. This is the meaning. That is what the Blessed One said. And the Venerable Kumar Kasapa was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So there you have it. All the little pieces. Now you draw the lines and put them all together and weave them together. And that's the whole story. Letting go and seeing what's left when you let go of the past and the future and all this craving and clinging and then start smiling. That's what you've got left. Okay. So we will take questions next time if it's okay with you. Is it okay? <laughs> Is, is it really <laughs> okay because he ran kind of late but you understand most of this yeah okay and I will talk to you about the retreat next time I wanted to have pictures when I was showing you but <laughs> the person with the camera left for Serbia this morning <laughs> and real early in the morning and he's over there in Serbia and we have to get these sent to Deepa and Did get you through uh, the talks yeah but they have they need some editing because i'm afraid i was sort of um very relaxed about some things that i talked about and they need to get edited correctly they should you know, they're just there's x there was extra information about things we didn't need in the talks themselves but the talks went really well and it was basically the eight pieces that we train you the six topics and than the Eightfold Path. And it went really well. And I just really liked it, you know, because of the, uh, the, the group that we had um, composed of the, you know, their professions and composed of who they were. You know, that was really nice. And we also had an Anagarika who, you know, helped me and uh, supported me while I was there. And that was a treat because I don't always have an attendant. I'm a sort of a renegade, <laughs> not a renegade really. I'm a solitary and I don't usually have somebody with me. And, um, you know, it, it was really nice. She's very sweet. Her name is Conti Paula and we're going to go and visit her. She is a solitary also, and she's in her sixties and lives on a farm that is near where this place was, but we can get there to visit her in October. I think we'll stay if I can travel, okay, we'll be able to go and see her. Yeah, okay, so we put our hands together and we say, mm -hmm. may suffering ones be suffering free and fearless be. Fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Unfortunately, I think the bell.